Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, following this morning's events and the curtailment of general question time, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 1629 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Uh, would any member who wishes to speak against the motion please press the request to speak button and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 1629. We'll allow general questions to continue just prior to decision time and moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion therefore I will now put the question to the chamber. The question is that motion number 1629 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed and the remainder of general questions will be taken at 4.50 p.m. before decision time. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 1580 in the name of Derek Mackay on reforming local taxation. May I ask members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Derek Mackay to speak to and move the motion. Um, up to 13 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate on reforming local taxation. The timing means that we've had ample opportunity to digest the findings of the Commission on Local Tax Reforms report from last December and reflect upon the various alternative reforms advanced in the May election. I would also like to thank all commissioners, especially those from beyond the world of politics and government, for the dedication and commitment to the report. The report, Just Change, a new approach to local taxation, is an excellent piece of work that sets out the fundamental concepts very clearly alongside some groundbreaking research. While it is inevitable that any report would not satisfy all shades of opinion, the work is authoritative, robust and insightful. The Commission's remit was to examine in considerable detail alternative systems of taxation rather than make a recommendation for a particular tax. Perhaps the best articulation of why this remit was right, and especially so for a cross-party and cross-government Commission, it was by the Commission itself when it concluded that we recognise that political parties in Scotland will attach different weights to the considerations we have set out and will therefore draw different conclusions about the best way forward. I am sure that recognition of different and perfectly valid views will be reflected in, deba in today's debate. And in doing so, we are implicitly acknowledging the achievement of the Commission and the work by the previous Local Government and Regeneration Committee in creating the space for change as evidenced by the different alternative forms of local taxation advanced in manifestos for the elections this year. It is therefore important to recognise that the report and indeed the reforms that this Government is undertaking are not the end of the story, but let me be very clear, they are the beginning. The remain a range of views, of course. Mike Rumbles. What the beginning was nine years ago with the SNP manifesto for the 2007 election, which in case you said that you would abolish this under fundamentally unfair council tax. Nine years later, you say this is the beginning? Derek Mackay. Well, I'm sure Mike Rumbles has reflected repeatedly on the fact that the SNP put a proposition to the people through the 2016 it manifesto and we were handsomely rewarded by the electorate of Scotland and that's why we are in the position uh, to be in government embarking on further legislation. What I'm saying from our proposition on local taxation however is we genuinely want to engage with other parties and wider Scottish society uh, to take forward uh, the next steps but we absolutely secured, I'd like to make just some more progress and then maybe take an inter further intervention and I think it is the case that we have a mandate to progress with what we proposed. But there do remain a, a range of views on what our next steps should be. There remain real differences among and between the parties here in the Chamber. But the one point I hope we can all unite is that the journey to a fairer and more sustainable local taxation system has only just begun. But the next steps should absolutely be about progressivity and the progressive uh, nature that can be delivered, something absent from the Tory uh, amendment, I, I would add. Now, we should all welcome today's debate in terms of that 
journey to be able to critically examine all the different proposals in a constructive spirit. The task before us will not be simple or straightforward. The present council tax was created by the 1992 Local Government Finance Act and has been largely unchanged ever since. And I think the Commission puts its finger on it when they noted that amongst all the taxes we pay, council tax is especially visible in that every household gets a bill. This is in contrast to uh, other taxes. VAT and a number of other taxes are part of the cost of goods and services are not always uh, visible, unlike uh, the council tax. And it's the realisation of this that sets just change apart. It recognises uh, the political uh, challenges. Uh, challenges around... Of course. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Um, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's openness but um, can he uh, address some concerns of my constituents in Struth Kelvin and Bears Den that the council tax raised in the councils will stay in the council tax area? Y yes, I, uh, yes, presiding officer, I can categorically assure every local authority area that every penny raised in council tax will stay in that local authority area. How we are proposing to allocate uh, revenues towards education, as was proposed in the manifesto, is through the revenue support grant. And what's fairly illustrative about that, it's similar to business rates in terms of how that mechanism works. And I don't hear the, the complaint that that uh, mechanism hasn't worked to the satisfaction of local government. So the principle is there. But I'm very clear, that which is raised at a local level through council tax will stay with those uh, local authorities. Council tax certainly is complex. It's not the only difficulty uh, to change. Just Change did note the complexity of the current council tax reduction scheme. But I want to be clear on this. Uh, whilst there are a huge number of regulations that define the scheme, they amount to around 200 pages, in part, this is because it needs to work for a vast range of people in real-world situations. And these can range from people receiving income from multiple sources, and that could never be captured by a P60, to ensuring that those with specific difficult circumstances, for example, carers, get the reliefs that we think uh, that they uh, need. And council tax uh, reduction is not universal. It's targeted to ensure that those... Uh, yes, I will. Thank you for giving way. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that uh, last week the Delegated Powers Committee ruled the Council Tax Reduction Scheme ultra vires. I just want to ask the Cabinet Secretary's view on that. Derek Mackay. I am uh, familiar with previous challenges to the competent nature of the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. I think Jackie Bailey used to propagate the argument that it was ultra vires out with the powers of the Parliament, arguably before the transfer of Social Security powers. Well, I've checked the record, Jackie. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, competency of the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, but what we were able to do in partnership with local government at the time that the UK government had abolished council tax benefit is design a scheme through change liabilities to support the most vulnerable in our society. And therefore, I do absolutely believe that it's within the competency of the Scottish Parliament. And we want to enhance and improve that welfare nature of the council tax reduction scheme through households tax uh, liabilities and I think that that will be uh, welcome news as part of uh, the reforms uh, to hard press uh, households in some very difficult circumstances uh, at this uh, particular uh, time. I've touched upon the complexity of the <coughs> council tax benefit or the council tax uh, reduction scheme and the necessity of that complexity to ensure uh, that we are actually protecting people uh, now and into the future. It presently applies reductions amounting to around £340 million to just under half a million households, approximately one in five. And without it, those on low incomes, or even for whatever reason, no income, would be exposed to the full extent of the present council tax system. And they would be liable for their full council tax liability, even though they would not have the means to pay. A telling thought given in the Commission heard much evidence pointing to the futility of taxing those who simply cannot pay. But the Council Tax Reduction Scheme offers some support in that respect. In fact, more progressive for the lowest income households. 
So I do accept the Commission's criticism of the scheme's complexity, but I also emphasise its importance to achieve the aim of support. Just Change looks at a number of alternatives, including a land value tax, which of course would require uh, further work, although economic principles are undoubtedly uh, appealing, but we must recognise the, the difficulties in determining land values within urban areas. And I'm sure that that debate will continue. We're also embarking uh, on work on uh, securing agreement and consultation around a potential levy on tax and development from vacant and derelict land to reduce land banking and increase the supply of homes, something that will take forward in a stakeholder uh, roundtable uh, imminently. Just Change considers income uh, as an important potential source of local tax, including drawing on HMRC's experiences of identifying Scottish taxpayers in readiness for the introduction of the Scottish rate of income tax earlier this year. Of course. Willie Rennie. Um, I'm keen to understand whether what he's proposing on this front is the assignment of local taxes for that local community, or is it just a share of national taxation across Scotland? Is it local or is it national? Derek Mackay. What we've proposed is a, a share of the national uh, element of income tax through uh, that formula, but that uh, engagement is still to have uh, to be had with local government. So I think that is an area that we we'll want to explore uh, with local government. But there's certainly an attraction to assignment of elements of, of income tax uh, to local areas, because I believe that that will incentivise growth and interest in local economies uh, and wider uh, interests, give greater financial accountability and less dependency uh, on central government grants. And that's certainly in, in the spirit of what many people are trying uh, to uh, achieve. But we are keen to explore uh, the alternative uh, of tax assignment that the Commission has identified, and we will formally consult on this before taking it forward. It could improve public understanding of how local services are funded, especially desirable given the preconceptions it reported in Just Change, and thus enhance the financial accountability of local government, giving local government a material stake uh, in the economy. It would also make overall taxation to fund local government more progressive and linked uh, to income. Earlier this month, I laid regulations. Of course. Jackie Bailey. People would regard the assignation of taxes as creating instability and uncertainty for local government. Taxes, whilst they may rise, might also fall. In the event that the yield fell, what would local government do? Would they just have to make cuts? Well, I've, said, I've said to the Chamber and I say to Jackie Bailey that we want to have that discussion with local government around how that could work. So we're not putting forward the concluded proposition. I think that that's a, an engagement worth having to understand the benefits and the risks of any such uh, proposition. The council tax regulations I have laid have set out changes both to council tax and the council tax reduction scheme. And if the Parliament agrees, these can be delivered from as early as council tax uh, bills next year, from April 2017. The changes to council tax will increase the charges on properties in bands E, F, G and H by 7.5%, 12.5%, 17.5% and 22.5% respectively. Uh, I really need to now move to the end of my uh, speech with about 30 seconds to go. I believe that these... Uh, Regulations will unlock uh, finance for education as delivered in the, as expressed in the SNP manifesto pledge. Uh, there will be protection in terms of the council tax reduction scheme changes uh, as well. These initial reforms can be delivered at low administrative uh, cost uh, and, and achieve uh, their purpose. Longer term change, I think, will need more discussion, consensus and engagement. And I am certainly committed to that through the motion and through the engagement with political parties eh, as we go forward. I am committed to that in a very positive, constructive uh, and collegiate way, recognising that we have not embarked on eh, a journey in local taxation. We want to make it more progressive, deliver the steps that we got support for at the elections, then engage further on what can be delivered <laughs> next in view of the report Just Change. 
I now call Myrtle Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 1580.1. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by welcoming the opportunity to have in this extended debate a discussion about uh, local tax uh, reform? Now, it's fair to say uh, at the start, and I should acknowledge my own party has something of a checkered history when it comes to local taxation. The Commission on Local Tax Reform states, and this is a direct quote, uh, history shows that reforms to local taxation are politically challenging. I think that might be something of an understatement. It was back in the 1980s, presiding officer in the midst of time, that a ratepayers' revolt against a rating revaluation led to the then Conservative government agreeing uh, for that form of local taxation to be scrapped. Its replacement was, of course, the immensely popular community charge. And we all remember thousands taking to the streets to celebrate its universal acceptance and success. <laughs> now, despite its undoubted popularity, the community charge was short-lived and was replaced in the 1990s by the council tax, which was intended to be a hybrid system between a property tax and a personal tax. So it was not a pure property tax, such as the rates had been, and the properties were valued in bands, and the proportion between the highest property and the lowest was set at three, so reflecting the fact that there was a personal element involved. The council tax has its advantages. It is an efficient tax, it is well understood and generally accepted, and it is relatively easy to collect. It does, of course, have its disadvantages. There is no direct link between the size or value of somebody's property and their ability to pay their tax bills. Single people living in larger properties will pay much more towards local services than a family of working people living next door in a smaller property but consuming many more council services. And because there has been no revaluation since the council tax was introduced, many properties today find themselves in the wrong band. And this can lead to frustration with constituents who cannot understand why they are paying more council tax than the identical property further along the street. So it is not surprising that over the years there have been a number of attempts to try and find a replacement for the council tax. Famously, we remember the SNP being elected in 2007 on a manifesto pledge to replace council tax with a local income tax. Now that was not something my party supported, but I accept that the SNP's success in that election was down in some way to this particular pledge, which capitalised on the concerns that many people had, particularly retired people, about the way that their council tax bills were rising at that time. Now, of course, the SNP were not successful in that parliament in taking those plans forward. It is curious, though, that when they became a majority government in 2011, they did not pursue the idea of a local income tax, even though they had a parliamentary majority at that time. And indeed, they now seem to have abandoned this notion altogether. Instead, what we have seen is a nine-year council tax freeze, something that we in this party have supported. The freeze has given council taxpayers relief from what were often uh, painfully fast-rising bills. And it's noticeable that council tax bills, which I remember in previous sessions of this parliament, in the early days of this parliament, were very often raised with me by constituents uh, as a serious issue, and now very rarely raised with me as a constituency issue. And I'm sure that's the case uh, for other members. The latest attempt by the Scottish Government to find a replacement for the council tax was to establish its Commission on Local Tax Reform to look at all the options, with a report published in December last year. It is a very thorough report, and it considers a number of possible ways forward. The Scottish Conservatives did not participate in this discussion, preferring instead our own separate Commission on Competitive and Fair Taxation, chaired by Sir Ian Macmillan. At that time, we were criticised by the Government and by other parties for not taking part in the Government Commission. Our feeling was it would have been duplication to have had two separate reports being worked on at the same time. The Government's Commission came to a very clear conclusion. The present council tax system must end. Unfortunately, as members were then able to, unable to agree beyond that, what should replace the council tax? In contrast, our Commission proposed that the council tax structure should remain largely as existing, but reformed to be a fairer and more progressive local tax with an increased multiplier for those at the upper end and additional protections for low-income households. It was therefore somewhat flattering to us to see that when the Scottish Government finally announced their plans for the council tax, they ignored more or less completely what their own commission had recommended and decided to adopt something very similar to what we had proposed in our commission. So we welcome that 
endorsement of all the hard work done on the government's behalf. Winston Churchill famously said of democracy that it was the worst system of government in the world until you considered all the alternatives. And I think the council tax is a bit like that. Everybody knows there are problems with the council tax, but we are yet to hear a better plan proposed by anyone in order to replace it. But we can continue, of course, to have that conversation. So in the Scottish Conservatives... We, yes, happened to Patrick you. Harvey. Can he explain to me, even if we were to accept the, the unhappy reality he paints that we have to uh, say council tax is the, is the least bad option. Is there a reason in principle why, if it's going to continue, it ought to be based on antique property values rather than current ones? Martha Fraser. M Mr Harvey makes, makes a fair argument for a revaluation. I accept in logic there's a very sound logical reason for a revaluation. However, on the counter to that, it would be an expensive and bureaucratic exercise, and I can guarantee we'd all have huge queues at our doors from constituents very unhappy if their properties had been revalued re and their bills were going up as a result. So there is a political judgment to be made about that, however logical that might seem. So in, in our party, we support proposals to end the council tax freeze, allowing councils the freedom to increase council tax annually up to 3%. We support additional protections for low-income households, and we support those in properties bans G and H paying a bit extra. Where we depart from the Scottish Government is in two respects. Firstly, we oppose the increases for those living in properties in bans E and F. These can be relatively modest properties, and we do not think it can be justifiable for all those who live in these properties to see a hike in their council tax. And just as seriously, we oppose the approach that ministers are taking in relation to how the increase in council tax will be dealt with. Ministers want to create a school attainment fund with money going direct to schools. That's an ambition that we agree. But they want to fund this by clawing back from councils that additional money, £100 million, that will be raised by these council tax revenues and take this centrally to pay directly to schools. Um, if, I, if I have... Very quickly, if, very quick if you would. What does uh, Meadow Fraser think of the Minister's statement just earlier that all the money raised <coughs> will be kept by local authorities? Would you agree with me that what he didn't say was that the government are actually going to take money away from those councils so council taxpayers are charged Mr. more? Mr Rumbles, that's services? hardly quick. Meadow Fraser. I think, I think Mr Rumbles ma ma makes his point perf perfectly well. So it's not surprising that this proposal from the government has been, uh, has been faced with outrage in local government circles. COSLA have made clear their opposition to these plans as breaking the link between the taxes raised from local householders being spent on local services. And there is absolutely no precedent for what is currently being proposed, which undermines both local democracy and local accountability. Presiding officer, I know that our concerns in this regard are shared not just by many of those in local government, but by other opposition parties in this chamber. Our amendment today highlights our concern about the SNP's centralising proposal. I hope it is something that will have the support of other opposition parties. Presiding officer, just to close, our plans uh, would be to raise funding uh, from those in properties and bans G and H only. That would raise an extra £30 million to put into local government on an annual basis. That is new money for local government when they face another punishing round of cuts, as the Fraser of Allender Institute warned just last week. It is money that could defend and support vital local services. Crucially, presiding officer, we will defend the principle of local democracy and local accountability and resist the centralising tendency, which is all too typical of this SNP government. I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 1580.2. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. You know, they do say you can learn much from history. So let me delve into the recent past to set a little context for the debate this afternoon, because it is truly instructive. And like others, let me take you back to 2007. In the SNP's manifesto, they said, and I quote, local taxes can be fairer. The SNP will scrap the council tax and introduce a fairer system based on ability to pay. Well, that was the first of many broken promises to follow. Then came 2011 and the SNP manifesto again. And here, let me quote, over the period of the next parliament, we will consult with others to produce a fairer system based on the ability to pay to replace the council tax. Well, that went well, didn't it? The SNP promised to replace the council tax, but instead have merely tinkered with it. So the broken promises continue. 
roll forward to the 2016 manifesto, and I asked presiding officer, where is that promise to scrap the council tax? I couldn't find it. In fact, it's completely disappeared. That perhaps is the biggest broken promise of them all. What we have instead is a set of proposals that are so timid, so lacking in ambition, that one wonders where this emanated from. Now, I can't imagine a scenario where Alex Neil, who was responsible for local government, is anything but timid. How would he, somebody like him, sign off something like this? So was it the First Minister or was it the Deputy First Minister? I think we should be told. No, the Cabinet Secretary is not going to enlighten us. But, you know, after all, our history is littered, absolutely littered, with quotes from John Swinney and Nicola Sturgeon. Remember? the discredited council tax, or the unfair regressive council tax, or my personal favourite presiding officer, Labour's hated council tax is totally unfair and any tinkering with bans would not make the system any fairer. Nicola Sturgeon, April 2007. You know, what a delicious irony. Here are the SNP simply tinkering with the bans and keeping, in their words, a hated and unfair council tax. Exact, no, exactly what the SNP said they were against. They say, presiding officer, that actions speak louder than words. The SNP's actions in this case are a mere whimper. Well, will you give away, Ms. well why not? You're not the quietest of them. So Kevin Stewart. I most certainly am not. But in just change itself, uh, the Commission talked about not only property taxation, but land taxation and income taxation. As the Cabinet Secretary has rightly said, this is the beginning. We are also talking about vacant and derelict land tax, consulting on that, and assignation of income tax. Can Do I you support Stewart. that? Is that can more I, progressive? Can I? Miss Bailey. I think that was a speech presiding officer, but I'll let that stick. Let, let me just enlighten the Minister. The first recommendation of the Commission was to end the council tax. Your motion before us today doesn't even give a commitment to do that. So frankly, I'm not going to take any lessons from the Scottish Government on this point. But it is an irony, it is absolutely an irony that the SNP can sit here today without embarrassment and tell us that they are about change when all they have done is simply you know, tinkered at the margins. A decade on, the SNP have not scrapped the council tax. Their proposals for reform are disappointing. They're lacking in ambition. The council tax is regressive. So the very poorest shoulder proportionately the larger burden. And the SNP have merely tinkered round the edges with this. But they had an opportunity to do it differently. In, in one second. I served on the Commission for Local Tax Reform together with Andy Whiteman. Gathered in the room were experts, practitioners, elected members from local government and from this parliament. We heard from professionals and directly from communities themselves about what they wanted to see. The officers serving the commission brought together data and modeling to help the members in their work and we are grateful to them for doing so. Because everything you needed to know about local government finance and the options available were actually in the commission's report. 19 separate recommendations, the very first of which, as I referred to earlier, was that the present council tax system must end. No, I think you should listen to this. Seven words, the shortest recommendation, but the most powerful. And the SNP can't bring themselves to implement the unanimous view of the commission by scrapping the council tax. I give way to the cabinet secretary. Derek Mackay. Jackie Bailey mentioned uh, embarrassment with policy. Does Jackie Bailey not uh, recollect during the course of the election it was the Labour Party that abandoned the welfare element of their local taxation policy? And she's not further embarrassed that she's proposing to replace a property tax with another Labour property tax. Yeah. Jackie Bailey. I am not remotely embarrassed that under Labour's proposals, two million households would be better off. 80% of people would pay less under our proposals, which are far more progressive than the SNPs ever are. But can I say to the Cabinet Secretary, this was a cross-party approach. He spent probably about 12 out of the 13 minutes telling us how good the report was. 
I have to say there shouldn't have been any surprises there. It was chaired by a member of his own government. So I don't understand why there is the need for delay. Unlike the SNP, Scottish Labour used the Commission's work to design our policy. We believe that the unfair council tax should be scrapped. And as I said to him, nearly 2 million households would be better off under our proposals and pay 80% less than they do today. In addition to that, we would provide local government with a basket of taxes, a land value tax on vacant economically inactive land, a tourist tax, develop and devolve sorry, the surplus from the Crown Estate. So a range of measures designed to transform local gov government funding. But let me turn to local government funding in closing, presiding officer, because they fund important things like teachers, schools, care workers for our older people. Last year, the SNP cut £500 million from the local government budget for 2016-17. We discover from the Accounts Commission report published today that the cuts aren't just 5%. It's not just 5% passed down from the UK government in the block grant, but a staggering 11% that the SNP decided to land on local government. A deliberate choice to cut local services. A clear case of continuing austerity. But you know, we have our very own brand of SNP austerity, which is austerity on stilts. The SNP has a choice. A choice to properly reform the funding of local government. A choice they have not yet made because they are too timid. All they will do, presiding officer, is continue to centralise control in Edinburgh, and I therefore fear for local services and local democracy. Would you move the amendment, please, Ms Bailey? And I'm happy to move the amendment in my name. I now call on Andy Whiteman to speak to and move Amendment 1580.3 up to seven minutes, please, Mr. Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm delighted we're having this debate in these precious two hours uh, on local taxation to discuss the report of the Commission on Local Tax Reform, a cross-party commission established by the Scottish Government, in which I had the privilege of sitting. We undertook our work in good faith, and I want to thank my fellow commissioners uh, and the members of staff uh, who provided very diligent hard work uh, in getting us to where we did. I think two of them join us today uh, in the chamber. We agreed that, and I quote, there is now a real prospect of beginning a programme to make local taxation fairer, more progressive, more stable, more efficient and more locally empowering. We entrusted those charged with taking this work forward to respect the spirit in which the Commission was established and had discharged its obligations. We agreed as our first recommendation that the present council tax system must end. That took us two nanoseconds. And we agreed, importantly, that this is an opportunity that must not be missed. That was our closing recommendation. Presiding officer, this in my view is the central question before Parliament, an opportunity that must not be missed. We have five years, but we do not yet have agreement on some fundamental principles that are taken for granted in other European countries in terms of the constitutional architecture for local government. Many of these principles were enshrined in international law by the Council of Europe in 1985 in the European Charter of Local Self-Government, an international treaty which, as the former minister and co-chair of the Commission, Marco Biaggi, confirmed in this chamber on the 17th of June 2015, is an international treaty to which we are bound. It commits us, he said, to applying basic rules guaranteeing the political, administrative and financial independence of local authorities. But these rules are, as I outlined earlier this week, being breached by the Scottish Government's proposals, most notably in this regard by the proposal to appropriate £100 million from council tax own resources and to reintroduce rate capping, not by statute, as the Tories, to their credit, although I didn't agree with it, but at least they had the courage to do it by statute under the Rates Act 1984, but by the back door, by stealth. Now, if Angela Merkel were to do this in Germany, it would be illegal yeah. under Article 28 of the German Constitution. Indeed, Kozla pointed out in evidence to the Local Government Committee this week that this is the first time in the history of local taxation since the introduction of the Poor Law in 1579 that local taxation has been appropriated for national spending priorities. None of the important detail is being addressed either. I have a constituent who lives in a banned E property, which is now worth quite a bit less, £20,000 less, in fact, the nearby flats that are in band B. Yesterday, Joan Houghton, Lothian Assessor and President of the Institute of, Ratings, of Revenue Ratings and Valuation in Scotland, said that she expected many appeals next year and that virtually all of these appeals would fail 
because the current statute insists on 1991 values being used. The Commission found 57% of properties in the wrong band. If we organised income tax on this basis, the First Minister and perhaps the Finance Secretary would be paying no tax today since she was a student in 1991. I don't know if Mr Mackay was perhaps still in school then or not. <laughs> I have another constituent. I have another constituent who had problems paying his council tax and now, in fact yesterday, had the sheriff officers knocking at his door. Council tax arrears is now the most common debt that clients of Citizens Advice Scotland seek advice on, according to its evidence to the Commission, and is, in the words of one money advice worker at East Sutherland, often the straw that breaks the camel's back. These are just two aspects of the council tax system we looked at, we took evidence of, that are crying out for reform, and to which the government has yet said nothing because it has not even formally responded to the Commission's report. I urge ministers, please read the citizens' advice evidence and the testimonies of people who tragically would be better off if their wages were arrested. Please appreciate how the work we undertook in the Commission was about sorting out so many problems that have been lying unattended for far, far too long. Problems that are in the gift of this Parliament to sort out. Now, since the Commission reported, a growing number of influential voices have appealed for the kind of ambitious transformation we sought to initiate. The Chair of the Commission on Housing and Wellbeing, the former auditor Robert Black, said in his report one year on, one recommendation was to reform the current system of property taxation, the council tax. This would seek to put an end to a system that disproportionately affects the poorest households. Regrettably, he continued, there has been no sign that the Scottish Government will revalue property values nor adjust how the tax is calculated, despite many properties sitting in the wrong band. And whilst acknowledging the government's proposals, he argued that these changes mean very little to those paying an unfair level of tax. Naomi Eisenstadt, the First Minister's independent advisor on poverty and inequality, urged ministers to be bold on local tax reform. And we've heard from the First Minister that she will accept all the recommendations of Professor Eisenstadt who further noted this is a central moment of political decision, an opportunity to introduce a much more progressive system, one that will have important implications, particularly for working households at or just above the poverty line. The proposals of the Scottish Government are an embarrassment. For a government whose finance ministers stand here and tell us that progressivity lies at the heart of their tax plans to perpetuate probably the most regressive tax in the UK is shameful. Presiding officer, the thing is that we can change. There is, I think, a progressive majority in this parliament to do so. We can, for example, do a revaluation. This is not a complex matter. This is a simple and straightforward matter with modern techniques. Kate Forbes. Could the member clarify how much a wholesale revaluation would cost and how long it might take? We've took Andy Whiteman. We took evidence on this and the figures are in the Commission's report. I don't recall the specific figure. The point I would make, though, is countries like Denmark not only do regular revaluations through mass appraisal and computer techniques, uh, they split the land values into the site value and the improvements for every property in the country, as does, does, does Estonia, which has the most competitive tax system in the OECD and levies tax only on the land in urban and rural areas. These things are done very, very straightforwardly. The land register has got 70% of properties on it. There's, there's information feeding in every single day on property uh, values. We can accommodate new liabilities through transition reliefs and tapers, as in Wales. Elderly households can be given deferral options, as legislated for in Northern Ireland. This is the Rates Deferment Regulations Northern Ireland that did it. None of this is terribly difficult. Today we published an alternative statutory instrument using the powers of the 92 Act that could be tabled next week by ministers to achieve much of this. I urge parties across the Parliament to rise to this occasion, to seize the moment and implement the many lessons and recommendations of the Commission's report and we will work constructively with all to do that. I urge ministers to have the decency to formally respond to the report. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. We now move to the open speeches, and time is really tight, so please, would everyone keep to below five minutes? Um, I first of all call Kate Forbes to be followed by John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
I stand here as an unashamed advocate of devolution, devolving power, responsibility and autonomy as close to the people whose lives are affected. The Gaelic for devolution is fain really, which literally means self-governing. And with new and old powers over taxation, all of us in this chamber have enjoyed a recent campaign offering the electorate different proposals on tax, including council tax. And whilst it was this government's party whose manifesto won a majority, I personally enjoyed the exchange of ideas on how tax is a means of and an illustration of self-government. And I continue to appreciate speaking to members on all sides of this chamber about how our taxes can be built on a solid foundation of accountability, fairness and localism. And today's debate is the start of reform. And as the Cabinet Secretary quoted from the Commission on Local Tax Reform, of all taxes, it's council tax that is especially visible and seems to attract most debate about devolution, about localism and about accountability. In our 2016 manifesto, again which I promoted throughout my local campaign in the largest council area of the Highlands, where perhaps we can feel the furthest from Edinburgh, and which I was still elected off the back of, we outlined our intentions to start the reform of council tax bans in a fair, balanced and progressive way. And alongside our proposals for raising tax, we very importantly identified the specific uses for the extra funds raised to make sure that our society is fairer and more prosperous. Now, those principles aren't new, but how we apply them is. This government has a proud record on delivering for local communities and mitigating the toll of the last recession on families up and down the country. And I've seen that first-hand in the Highlands. In freezing the council tax for nine years and still providing the extra funds to councils for basic public services, the government ensured that council tax was affordable for hard-pressed families across Scotland. However, we recognise that the time has come to lift the freeze in order to give councils greater freedom while simultaneously ensuring that any increases are capped at 3% in recognition of the continuing economic challenges facing many. Mike Rumbles. It's hard to reconcile what the member has just said. In Aberdeenshire, for instance, these government proposals will take millions of pounds away from local authority because they're going to cut the grant. So it's opposite of what you're saying. The, Kate Forbes. The two points I'd say in response to that is that we have made clear that every penny raised will be spent in that council tax area. And our plans are progressive because it's those with the broadest shoulders that will take the burden of the increases. So we, as I've said, we recognise that the time has changed and it's time to lift the freeze. And by changing the property bans for those who reside in E to H listed properties, council tax is more progressive because, as I've just said, those with the broadest shoulders will pay a fairer share. And in practical terms, that means that, only, that three quarters of Scots will pay no more council tax, which is 1.8 million Scots in real terms. Now, as an accountant, I recognise that tax is a lever, and I want to see council tax being used to protect family incomes, support local services, and deliver a vision of a fairer and more equal society where children will never be discriminated against in our education system because of poverty. In terms of levers, I'd also like to put on record my support for this government's plan to give councils the option of offering no discount for second homes as a method for tackling rising house prices for full-time residents. As I highlighted in my rural housing speech last week, this is an issue of vital importance for those in rural constituencies and this action is a very, very positive step. So, to briefly sum up, I do believe that these gov this government's plans on local, tax local taxation 
are ambitious but also fair. And I also recognise that this is the start and not the end. Thank you. John Scott to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And by common consent, no system of local government finance is perfect, and it's certainly the case that no system is universally popular. And in view of the history of local government finance in Scotland and across the UK, it's a measure of its resilience that the council tax has lasted, although not without criticism and not without flaws, for the last 23 years. Of course, strong criticism has in the past been levelled against the council tax. Many will remember the words of Alex Salmond when he said, there will be no misunderstanding. We are determined to abolish the unfair council tax. Change days indeed, and Jackie Bailey has already drawn attention to this. So perhaps I can set out where I agree with the Scottish Government's approach. After years of debate and abortive proposals from a range of alternatives, including local income taxes and land value taxes, ministers have settled on reform of the existing council tax system. So I welcome their acknowledgement, belatedly, that the council tax is essentially a sound system of local taxation. It is hard to avoid, transparent, comparatively cheap to administer, has a high collection rate and, insofar as is possible, accepted by taxpayers. And we, on this side of the chamber, also endorse the ending of the council tax freeze. But this is not, of course, an endorsement of rising council tax bills. As Conservatives, we look to councils to keep a lid on spending to curb taxpayers' bills. But it is right and proper that those elected to serve as councillors should take the ultimate decisions over local taxes and bear responsibility for those decisions. And it is at this point that I must depart from the Scottish Government's plans. It is hard to see the logic of, on one hand, restoring local accountability through ending the council tax freeze, while, on the other hand, ministers claw back a proportion of local tax revenues to distribute as they decide. The creation of an attainment fund is a welcome step. Ministers' proposed method of funding it is not. As COSLA President David O'Neill last week said, there is a clear and honourable link between taxes raised from local householders being spent on local services, and this has been a Scottish tradition for generations. The Scottish Government will destroy that link with their plans to use council tax money for a national policy. I'd really rather not, because you'll know we're very short of time already. Forgive me. The Attainment Fund is a policy of the Scottish Government, and it is the responsibility of the Government Ministers to identify the funding for it from their own budgets, rather than saddle local councils with the bill. So those in Band D houses will see a £105 rise, Band F houses will see a £207 increase, and Band G a £335 increase, while at the very top, Band H householders will see their bills increase by £517. And these reforms will ex affect 674,793 households across Scotland. And while, of course, we welcome the proposed exemptions, if not the council tax reduction scheme, which we believe is not within the gift of the Scottish Government, this, nonetheless, is a significant additional burden on ratepayers in Scotland and will give further credence to the growing view that Scotland is an expensive place to live and work. In my constituency of Ayr, many higher rate taxpayers in the aerospace industry, for example, have transferable skills, much sought after, in demand worldwide, and this will do little to encourage them to remain in Ayrshire and Scotland. And as the government knows it's difficult enough not just to retain existing businesses and jobs in Scotland, but this additional layer of taxation is just one more obstacle to overcome in terms of encouraging further inward investment at this time. So, of course, we all want to see the attainment gap close, and of course it needs to be funded, but nonetheless we feel this is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Local authorities are constantly seeing their roles reduced by government's centralising agenda as functions and responsibilities which used to be theirs are removed and taken back to the centre and put under the ever-tightening grip of Scottish ministers. In the long run, this is bad for local democracy and accountability and discouraging for local councillors and council staff who are wondering what their role will be in five years' time as they approach next year's election. As David and Neil again pointed out, this is a universal solution to a very targeted issue. 
And while we know that the money will certainly be spent, an additional £100 million per year for a laudable aim, that of closing the attainment gap, I just hope the gap does indeed get closed by this measure. Mr Swinney, Mr Mackay, we will be watching you very closely. And if the money is spent and the gap does not close, the people of Scotland will pass their judgment on you at the next election. Thank you. Willie Rennie to be followed by Bob Doris. I swear I saw a shiver running down Derek Mackay's <laughs> spine there when John Scott threatened to watch him. Better watch out. Um, this debate has been mired, I would say, in rhetoric from the very beginning, all the way back to the poll tax days to the very present day today. If you look back to what Nicola Sturgeon said in 2007, she regarded the council tax as hated. She said that actually, and this is very interesting, she said that tinkering with the bans would not make the system any fairer, but would require damaging revaluation. So it's an interesting perspective from even back in 2007, where she said tinkering was insufficient, but that's exactly what we've got today. And what is interesting, despite all the other um, high rhetoric in between times back in 2010, when it was regarded as regressive and unfair, they were going to have a cross-party review in 2011, it took to 2014 for that to happen. But even Marco Biaggi, when he launched this commission, regarded the council tax as an unfair uh, measure. And then Andy Whiteman quite rightly pointed out that the Commission report itself continued to say that the council tax should end. So even up to the present day, the rhetoric has remained strong. But now we have a different policy, which is to retain the exact thing that was um, regarded as hated and regressive before. But the rhetoric has been ramped up again. I mean, we just heard earlier on from Kate Forbes that now the council tax is progressive. <laughs> I don't know what Nicola Sturgeon was thinking back in 2007, why she didn't hear Kate Forbes in the future saying it was going to be progressive. And they even cited in the manifesto that Adam Smith principles would be adopted with the implementation of the changes. Adam Smith. And they talked about being fair and balanced, reasonable and balanced. It was going to promote fairness. These are all now the principles at the heart of the hated and regressive council tax. So I find it's quite dispiriting that the rhetoric remains high, but the principles have changed. Yes, absolutely. Derek Mackay. Willie Rennie is providing a critique of others. That's fair enough. But can Willie Rennie maybe expand on the detailed position on council tax from the Liberal Democrats? Because it seemed pretty vague on this matter in the manifesto. Well, Derek Rennie. Mackay has been studying the manifesto. Um, he's obviously worried about what John Scott's going to think next. Um, but. <laughs> But we, we have been uh, in favour of a local income tax. We were prepared to join the Commission in a spirit of cross-party consensus to seek a long-standing solution for the future. We thought that was the right thing to do because local taxes have been the subject to heated political debates over the year. So we were prepared to put our lot in with this Commission, but were desperately disappointed when 16 out of 19 recommendations from this Commission were rejected by the government within months of the report being published, not just now. So we were in favour of ending the council tax. We were now in favour of looking at land value taxation. We believe that has got some merits which are worthy of consideration. In fact, the Commission themselves considered this. It would look at um, derelict land, bringing it back into use, particularly in urban areas. It works in other countries. We've got, uh, you'd be able to um, make sure that you were able to adapt the system to perhaps not just now working in partnership with the business taxation system, perhaps simplifying the process. And you would not be also penalised for improvements to your property, not just now. So these are the benefits of a local um, land value taxation system. And I think bringing that into a, a wider reform programme would have significant benefits. And that's why we welcome it today. The, um, the proposal that we should continue working on a, an enduring system uh, for the future and what the government is proposing is inadequate. We are also in favour, as members will know, of introducing a real progressive increase in taxation, which is a penny on income tax, not just the, the timid amounts that the Scottish Government are proposing for education, but £500 million for education with a proper 
progressive tax, which now the SNP seem to regard that as not being progressive, but the council tax has been progressive. The world has just turned upside down. I don't know what the minister is thinking these days. But all these proposals are part of a wider package that are required to make sure we can invest in public services, have a proper local system of taxation for the future, not just taken from one part of the country to another in an arbitrary fashion, but proper taxation that can invest in public services and can deliver a progressive system for the future. Thank you. Bob Doris to be followed by Richard Leonard. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this afternoon's debate on reforming local taxation. In doing so, I consider the, the debate to be timely and I hope a constructive opportunity for Parliament to come together and take forward ongoing reforms to local taxation. For me, that's actually the, the key point. The current Scottish Government reforms are not the last word in reform. That's already been made clear by the Cabinet Secretary in his opening speech. Uh, and as convener, of this session's Local Government and Communities Committee, I am keen to support that approach and that debate. I would take issue with those who claim the current suite of reforms are too timid. Following several years of a council tax freeze, local taxpayers will see their council tax rise again by up to 3%. That's not timid, that's sensible. We well remember the massive hikes in council tax in years gone by that impacted on many, many of our communities. That was certainly true for many of my constituents in Glasgow. One moment, uh, a 3% ceiling therefore provides my constituents with a welcome degree of protection. Briefly, Patrick. Patrick Harvey. I'm very grateful. Bob Doris may feel that 3% is the right limit, but why should it be decided nationally and imposed locally rather than giving local councils control of their own rates? Bob Doris. Well, I think uh, Patrick Harvey makes a reasonable point. We're not quite sure yet the procedures which will underpin the 3% ceiling. And there's ongoing dialogue that has to take place in relation to that. So those discussions, I think, will be, will be ongoing, Mr Harvey. Let me turn now to the proposed reform of the multipliers, which sets council tax levels for those uh, staying in properties in bands E through to H. For those in band E properties with incomes above £25,000, they will see their bills on average increase by £106. In the wealthiest properties in band H, that will be an average of £517 each and every year. And place that, presiding officer, in the context also of that additional 3% increase. It's no surprise then that the Scottish Government is bringing in an enhanced council tax reduction scheme to benefit 54,000 households on incomes below £25,000 eh, and with plans for tapered support for certain households above that income threshold. The Local Government Committee is scrutinising the statutory instruments that underpin these changes and we actually got consensus that the change system is fairer. Now, I have to, for the record, say the terminology of whether it's less regressive or more progressive, that perhaps becomes a, a debating point. But there was consensus that the reform system is fairer, and we should all, everyone in this chamber, should welcome that. Now, I want to turn briefly in a moment to revaluation, but if we were to revalue and we go for a proportionate system eh, of council tax bandings, on a rebanding system, that would mean that band H properties would not see their council tax rise by £500, they would see it rise by 250%. And you've got to remember, some of those properties currently in band H would no longer be in band H, and other ones would move up to band H. Now, that is a huge tax increase for any constituent at any band level. At one moment, and I have to say, it's not that I'm unwilling to do that, but I think an important principle of taxation is you have to try your best to get a degree of consensus with your local taxation base eh, as you move towards more progressive forms of taxation. And just to be clear, the local taxation base are all the constituents we represent. I don't think I'm going to have time. I apologise. And of course, we should have eventually move towards a, a revaluation, but at the same time as a 3% increase in council tax and at the same time as additional increases to bands E to H, ranging depending on which local authorities stay in from £95 to £554, then no, not at this time, but yes, and of course plans at some point do have to be prepared with consensus, I hope, about how we move, I would say, in the medium term towards 
a revaluation. Now, I want to say finally, uh, as, we draw, as, as I draw to, uh, to close my contribution, that the money will be spent on educational attainment. And this will be redistributive, but just for clarity, it's not necessarily redistributive. Well, Mr Rumbles, you might learn something here. What will actually happen is it will take money from wealthier families and it will actually invest that money for children who are, who are living in deprivation, including children in middle class and upper class areas that are afflicted by the poverty and whose educational attainment gap is suffering. So I'm proud of these reforms, but it is only the first stage, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Paul Richard Leonard, followed by John Mason. Mr Leonard, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to contribute this afternoon to this important debate, which I hope will be a reminder to the Cabinet Secretary that the principal purpose of this Parliament is not for Ministers to transmit the will of the Scottish Government to MSPs and to the people. It is for MSPs in this Parliament to transmit the will of the people to the Scottish Government. And people are looking to this Parliament this afternoon to show a lead, to be bold, to make progress from the Scottish Government's nine years of frozen initiative, annual budgets, short-term programmes, missed opportunities and lack of imagination. And let me say this as well, in the 2015 general election, the SNP claimed that they would form a progressive anti-austerity alliance, and yet their flagship policy of the council tax freeze was and is not progressive, but regressive, benefiting most the richest people in the biggest houses. And of course, it hasn't countered austerity either, it has deepened austerity. People are complaining that local authorities are introducing and putting up charges. But what do you expect? What do you expect when the council tax has been frozen for nine years? The Labour Party's stance in this debate is straightforward. We should be using a universal and progressive system of taxation on property uh, to invest, to invest in the collective provision of public services to lift the whole of society. Not using uh, local charges to raise revenue for local government, but using fair taxation on the basis of the old socialist idea of from each according to their means to each according to their need. And I don't doubt that we have to change the mood of the country to open people up to the possibility that it can be better than this. That good democratic accountable public services demand good democratic accountable public investment. Because the question before us is not whether we should raise the money or not, but how we should raise it. And to the Conservative Party, I say that we reject on this side of the Parliament the view that the well-being of others and the public interest is only achieved when pursuing personal self-interest. We stand for need before greed and people before profit. Of course, when the SNP first formed the government in 2007, they did it on the basis, as we have heard, of scrapping the council tax. They even hailed it as, and I quote, the biggest tax cut for Scots in a generation, which could only have been a reverential nod to the infamous Lawson budget of 1988, which saw the abolition of all but one of the highest rates of taxation, bountiful tax cuts for the better off, the biggest tax redistribution from the rich to the poor in the whole of the last century. But of course, the SNP's proposed local income tax idea was neither local uh, nor, in fact, a tax on income. The tax was to be set nationally by the nationalists, and it wasn't a tax on income, it was a tax on earnings. Income from interest payments, income from share dividend payments were excluded. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Labour Party's stance is clear. We need to ensure that a tax on property remains. Property plays a central role in both wealth accumulation and wealth inequality. According to Shelter, the wealthiest tenth of households possess five times the housing wealth of the poorest tenth. Wealth inequality is twice as big as income inequality in this uh, country. And in fact, a report called Know Your Place, produced by Shelter, said this, housing is the single greatest repository for wealth held by individuals in the United Kingdom. So if we are to seriously tackle inequality, we need to concentrate not just on income inequality, but wealth inequality too. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, let's win the battle of ideas that local government 
can be an agent of change, a vehicle for investment, a generator of jobs, a provider of publicly run public services. Who knows, a bit of municipal socialism too. We need new horizons. We should be according our old people the dignity they have worked for, according our young people the chance of a job, fair work and a decent home, according our children good education. These are things we have in our gift to create, if only we have the will, the courage and the determination. This doesn't depend on independence. We can use the powers of this parliament to do it now. So let's seize this chance to make this change and have the courage of our convictions. Thank you, Ms. Thank you Mr. Leonard. I now call John Mason to be followed by Alison Harris. Mr. Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, one of the big successes of the SNP in government has been to end ring fencing of funds for local government. When I was a councillor in Glasgow under the Labour Lib Dem administration between 1999 and 2007, there was constant complaint cross party that money was ring fenced. Glasgow might have invested well in libraries, for example, but then a pot of money would arrive from the centre which was ring fenced for libraries. So I am very pleased that local authority control has been increased under the SNP. But the next question is how we can reform local taxation. Firstly, again, I believe that uh, we should be trying to give councils as much control as possible, as we have done with expenditure, uh, but also uh, the fact that council tax is not fair and the rich are paying too little. Now, one of the main conclusions from the Commission last December was that there is not an easy solution to this challenge. And probably there is not one single tax which meets all the requirements. Property tax usually does not take full account of income, while income tax can miss out the wealthy who have a low income. My key personal targets in any reform would be that, firstly, those with wealth pay a fairer share, and secondly, those with a higher income pay a fairer share. Clearly, we do face certain practical constraints along the way. For example, with land valuation tax, now, I have had this explained to me a number of times, and it does seem very attractive in principle. But I'd struggle to explain it, and I suspect other colleagues would also struggle to explain it to constituents. And the challenge of getting a wide public understanding is huge. Uh, if you don't mind, because I've got quite a lot I want to cover. Yeah, I'm not yet a minister, and probably never. So the, the, the broad... Local, sorry, local income tax is also attractive, uh, at least for a uh, part of the tax base. But under the present system, whereby HMRC have a monopoly on collecting income tax, I think it may well be impracticable. So the broad conclusion of the Commission to have property and income as the main basis for local taxation seems good to me. As they also suggest, allowing local taxation to add smaller taxes, like environmental, resource, sales or tourist taxes, would give additional freedom and accountability at a local level. Now, I was extremely disappointed at the decision to leave the EU, but obviously we do need to grasp any opportunities that come along. And one of these might be to vary the rates of VAT within the UK, something that has not been allowed under EU rules, and that, which is why VAT is being partly assigned to this parliament. So potentially Scotland could have a different VAT rate from the rest of the UK, and local authorities could set a different VAT rate from the rest of Scotland. Now I'd like to make some remarks on property valuation. Assuming there is to be a local property tax of some kind, I do think we need to get closer to the real valuations of people's houses, and I accept uh, Bob Doris's point in the medium term. The current very broad bands of council tax mean people get incredibly upset if they slip into a higher band. For example, from D to E in Glasgow means an extra £360 per year. And the fact that new properties, of which I have many in my constituency, are assessed in 1991 valuations, strikes everyone, including myself, as difficult to understand and unsustainable. Another reason I believe we need to look at revaluation is that no account is taken of relative changes in property prices since 1991. I asked one of my staff to look at relative property price changes in the east and the west of Glasgow since 1991, and I have to say I found the results pretty staggering. In 1991, the average price of a, a sandstone flat in Shettleston Road was 27,000 in the East End, Hindland Road in the West End, 60,000. Shettleston Road has gone up from that 27 to roughly 63,000. That's about a two and a half times increase. Hindland Road has gone up from 60,000 to 326,000, more than five times. 
Now, that says to me that the poorer parts of Glasgow, like the East End, are paying more than their fair share of council tax. So if there is no revaluation, that favours the richer people in the richer areas and disadvantages the ordinary people in the poorer areas. The Commission report itself talks about houses worth 15 times another house, but council tax is only three times more. Now, that would change to 3.7 times under the changes proposed to bands E to H. But I still wonder if 3.7 is really fair enough. Now, I do accept that a revaluation of, pro of properties has problems. There is administrative cost. There are serious increases for some house owners. But it is 25 years now, and the longer we wait, the worse it gets. If we are sticking with a variation of council tax, I think we need to consider this. I accept not this year, but in the not too distant future. And if we're moving to a different property tax, eh, then I think eh, we need to look at closer values right from the word go. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alison Harris, to be followed by George Adam. Ms. Harris, please. Deputy Presiding Thank Officer, I am delighted today to make a contribution towards a debate on a subject that has, over many years, generated much heat, exercised the minds of members of various commissions set up to look into the matter, and yet remains such a live issue. For over 400 years, two things have largely been accepted as central to the acceptance of local taxation. Firstly, that the usual method of tax collection has been through a tax on property. And secondly, that local taxation raised locally is spent locally. And I shall return to this later in my speech, although I note with interest what the Cabinet Secretary said earlier. Over the years, a number of attempts have been made to bring forward reforms to how money is raised to contribute towards the cost of local services. In 2006, the proposals of the Burt Commission to charge a percentage of the capital value of properties was dropped like a hot potato by the government of the day. The first SNP government was elected with plans to introduce local income tax. Another plan dropped when the many flaws of such a scheme were brought home. The Commission for Local Tax Reform was next to have an attempt at resolving the issue, but whilst calling for an end to the council tax, did not produce a specific new system to replace it. Then, largely ignoring the work of that Commission, the SNP Government sought to move forward by supporting the recommendations of the Commission for Competitive and Fair Taxation, set up by the Scottish Conservatives. Now, myself and colleagues normally do not mind the adoption of many sound Conservative ideas by the SNP, but, and this is a very big but, the SNP certainly have put a sting in the tail. Whilst my party only support increasing the multiplier in the two top bands, the government intends to increase the tax burden on the 535,000 families living in homes in the E and F bands, thus penalising many hard-working people on middle incomes who might not benefit from any reduction scheme. I'm sorry, I have too much to say. 535,000 households being asked to pay more than they need thanks to this SNP government. But not content with asking people on middle incomes to pay more, Proposals are made to break a central point to the acceptance of, I'm sorry, I'm too, bit too much to say, on the, right, but not content with asking people on the middle incomes to pay more, proposals are made to break a central point to the acceptance of the system for hundreds of years, that local taxation is raised locally and spent locally. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is my belief that national taxation is the vehicle to iron out disparities between communities not sending money raised as local taxation in one area to other areas. No, I'm sorry. Local taxation is to meet the specific needs of the local community from which it is raised. In that, I am happy to agree with the Labour President of COSLA, David O'Neill, who, as John Scott said earlier in his speech, has already mentioned this with plans relating to tax. If the Scottish Government is determined to press ahead with these proposals, and force Middle Scotland to pay more, the least many people will expect is to see that the extra tax is going to contribute to maintain local services in their community, not be siphoned off for a policy, no matter how worthy... The members don't take interventions. That policy, well, no matter how worthy that policy is, should no, it should be funded nationally. Council tax now accounts for the raising of only around 12% of town hall expenditure, having fallen dramatically over recent decades from an approximate 50-50 split being raised locally and grants from central government. 
This has meant that the discretion of councils to raise money has been so much reduced, and now with the ending of the council tax freeze, the SNP again step in with their centralising agenda over the heads of elected local councillors to attempt to take local money to fund a national policy. Thus continuing the process of reducing the discretion that councils have to meet the aspirations of local residents. I believe that we must take opportunities of restoring that discretion, not continuing to remove it. The government must abandon the constant centralising of power to itself at the expense of local councillors. Councillors have a vital role to play in our democracy, but without giving them discretion and indeed responsibility, interest in counts local councils and turnout at local elections will diminish. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, can I remind the Chamber of part of the remit given by the Government when it established the Commission for Local Tax Reform? The requirement to consider the impact of alternative local tax systems on supporting local democracy, including on financial accountability and autonomy of local government. I urge them to look again at their centralising and penalising proposals, remove the increased tax burden from middle income families and maintain the principle that local taxes raised are spent locally. Thank you. Thank you. Can I remind members it's a tight five minutes, which means air on the other side. Uh, George Adam to be followed by Neil Bibby. Mr Adam, please. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you for hinting at the fact that I should take, uh, make haste with my speech here today. I'm aware as a former councillor that I understand how local government is important and how we make the decisions that can work as a former local councillor in their area to make these differences in the local communities. But I'm also aware that local taxation has always been a very hot topic. And it is because it is uh, one part of uh, taxation that the member of the public could actually tell you how much they're actually paying to the exact amount because they know it comes out unlike others, it comes out, it doesn't come off the source of their salary, it comes directly, they pay it themselves. And that's what makes it so controversial with members of the public because then they look at the local authority and they ask, what am I getting from the local authority with regards to what I'm paying? And when you look at the fact that uh, some of the government's ideas and beliefs and uh, proposals is talking about giving local government the opportunity to be more flexible, more open in their finances, it shows that we are moving towards that position of showing that we can make local government uh, accessible to the members of the public. And one of the things I'm, I am also aware of, and one of the things that the debate has mentioned as well, is every one of us in here believes that we have to do something to bridge the educational attainment gap. We all agree on that part of the debate. And the fact that the government has said the £100 million that will be raised for it will be used for the educational attainment gap is part of something we've all bought into, whether it be local authority or whether it be actual Scottish government. And I think, you know, when you hear other parties talking about the fact that, you know, that that's an issue, I, I feel uncomfortable with that because it is something... Yes, I will, Mr Harvey. Or... Can I, Mr. Can Harvey, I ask sorry. the member to reflect on what he's just said? Of course, we all support action to close the attainment gap and to improve educational outcomes for all young people. But the, it is untrue to suggest that the political parties across this chamber have bought into the idea of effectively hypothecating local revenues to pay for a national policy. Mr. Adam. I think it's about actually delivering in the real world and ensuring that we can make sure that that attainment gap is actually bridged. And if we have to find a way to make that happen, working in tandem with local authorities, Mr. Harvey, I see that as a way forward. But one of the most important uh, aspects we've got to look at is I'm aware that Scottish Government proposals is protecting households' incomes in Scotland. Like 2.4 million households in Scotland will be protected from any undue rises in council tax in 2017. By the capping of increases by 3%. And this ensures that our communities, our families, our friends, they don't stay return to the sky high annual tax increase that they received on years gone by. Because it was before this government came into place that a lot of uh, uh, individuals and uh, communities were actually paying up to 60%, risen over a period of 60% tax rise in council tax. This is important that the public are protected from that and make sure that we have the flexibility and the ability that they can actually see value in local government as well. Because I'm a great believer, presiding officer, in local government. And I have to make sure that as working as partners... Yes, I will, because the way you hold your hips just can't make me stop there. <laughs> I know you like <laughs> Mr Kerr, I, I don't think you should read anything into that, Mr Kerr. 
Given that point, George, how would you respond to the Press and Journal talking Please use about the member's full name. How would George Adam respond to the Press and Journal talking about families in Aberdeen and Shire handing over £47 million pumped into educating youngsters in other parts of the country? Mr Adam, my belief, my belief in education is the fact that this is a uh, bridging the educational attainment gap is a responsibility for every single one of us in this chamber and it's something in Scotland we should all uh, desire to make sure that every child born regardless of where you're born you get the opportunity so if you want to play politics and say you want to keep certain things and just look after your own wee patch you carry on but I want to look after the people of Scotland and ensure that they get that opportunity in future for themselves so one of the things I would actually say that the, uh, we all know that uh, what many of us know what local government delivers and what they do but for me as I said as a former councillor I think we have to make sure that the scrutinise of local government make sure that the local governments are, are open and transparent I always appreciate the fact that the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary sees this as a starting point because the Commission itself actually seen only saw this as a starting point I'm very tight for time but if you do very quickly I'll Mr Whiteman I have an email here I received earlier I stay in Paisley and have a house in band E the house next door is worth £50,000 more, yet it's in Band C. An SNP member, he says, I've emailed my local and regional parties to support a full review, but the reply they sent was fluff. Is that a fair description of the government's policies? Mr Adam. Well, I don't remember ever saying to anybody, if anyone came to me with that actual case, I would take it very seriously. I don't believe I would call it fluff in any shape or form. And I think we have to deal with that issue as well. But can I just say in closing, presiding officer, because uh, I would like to say that I see this as a way forward. I see this as a start. I do believe that others talked about land tax and other ideals, but we're delivering for the here and now and giving us the opportunity to make sure that we can get the money, make sure local government can actually build on things but let's look to the future and let's see what we can actually deliver further down the line thank you i call leo bibby to follow by ruth mcguire who will be the last speaker in the open debate mr bibby thank you president officer the question of how we properly fund our local authorities is crucial to the public services we all rely on it's crucial to our schools it's crucial to our local economies and it's crucial particularly to the most vulnerable people in our communities and it's those vulnerable families who are being hit the hardest by this government's continued underfunding of local government. Those least able to cope with service cuts are bearing the brunt of the SNP government's 11 per cent cut to our local authorities. As Kezia Dugdale said at First Minister's questions earlier today, that's more than double uh, the rate of the Tories' cut to the block grant. On this side of the chamber, as Jackie Bailey pointed out, we recognise the need for fundamental reform of local taxation. We are committed to abolishing the unfair council tax once and for all. We support the introduction of a fairer system based on the value of our property so that nearly two million households will be better off. Our calculations are based on modelled evidence provided to the Commission on local tax reform and on which all four parties are now relying. We would also broaden the tax base and empower local government, as Jackie Bailey mentioned, by devolving new tax raising powers such as a tourist tax and a land value tax. This type of devolution of power to local authorities is long overdue and would allow them to raise revenue from previously untapped streams. It would also allow our local authorities to ensure that everyone who benefits from local services contributes to them, with the richest paying their fair share. A number of local authorities have called for these powers, including Renfrewshire Council, where the Cabinet Secretary and I represent. It's important to note as well that Scottish Labour has said that we would raise additional revenues through income tax by asking the richest in society to pay a 50p top rate of tax. We would generate additional money which we would use to invest in public services like education. And the crucial thing is, if we do want first-class public services, we have to pay for them. And actions have to match the rhetoric we so often hear in this chamber. We will not succeed in improving our education system and closing the attainment gap if we continue to slash the budgets of local authorities and limit the ability to invest in our young people's future. The report of the Commission on Local Tax Reform states the present council tax has therefore rightly become discredited in the eyes of the public. It was made clear to us that people expect change. But a decade on from their promise to scrap the council tax, the Scottish Government's proposals are not nearly bold enough. And it's not just me saying that. As Andy Whiteman said earlier, the SNP Government's own poverty advisor, Naomi Eisenstadt, is also calling 
for bold action. She said local tax reform is a real opportunity to protect the incomes of both the working poor and those at risk of being in work poverty, but it will require boldness and vision. The Cabinet Secretary says he wants to... Yeah. Ms Martin. I'm interested to, to know what you think, because I'm from Aberdeenshire, and people in work in oil and gas, they work in public services as well, and they have a real issue there because our house prices now... Could you raise your microphone, please? Oh, apologies. Um, I'm from Aberdeenshire, and I'm interested to know what the member think about people in that area where house prices are very high and inflation... Of, if, so if there was re-evaluation there, then that would really impact on the sorts of people that don't have the high incomes, like um, people who are teachers and work in public services. So I feel that, that there may be that something missing. Can I just make aspect. a short intervention? I think yeah. you made your point. Thank you. Well, a, a proposal will result in 80 per cent of people, two million households, uh, being, being better off, and we are committed to ensuring the fairest uh, possible uh, new replacement uh, tax. Um, SPICE uh, have described the government's proposal as falling short of making the council tax a proportionate tax. The Commission says the present council tax system must end and that local tax needs substantial uh, reform. Presiding officer, in his motion today, the Finance Minister talks about the opportunity for change. I hope that is exactly what Mr Mackay's appointment as Finance Secretary will mean, not just for tax reform, but for his own constituents in Renfrewshire and Inverclyde. I hope uh, that when Mr Mackay announces his budget, he ensures that Renfrewshire and Inverclyde uh, will see much needed increases uh, in their funding. Um, it's quite simple because a cut to the local authority budget is a cut to councils like Renfrewshire and Inverclyde. It's quite, it's quite simple and it will be his constituents and those across Scotland who will be the ones who continue to suffer the consequences. Finally, President Officer, the, the Cabinet Secretary faces a choice on local tax reform. He can work with Scottish Labour to abolish the council tax completely and replace it with a fairer property-based system which would see 80 per cent of households pay less, or he can continue with what Professor Kenneth Gibb described to the Local Government and Communities Committee as a political fudge, which does not resolve the underlying problems. The Cabinet Secretary's constituents and people across Scotland deserve a lot better than that. Thank you. Call Ruth McGuire, then move to closing speeches. Ms McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the report of the Commission on Local Tax Reform as I do the opportunity to contribute to this afternoon's debate on reforming taxation. I think it's probably fair to say that some will consider the new council tax less regressive as opposed to more progressive. And I recognise that much remains to be done as we work towards creating a fairer and more sustainable system of local taxation. What's proposed is an improvement, though. As has been made clear, the changes that will come into force from April of next year represent an important first step. I welcome that the government remains open to further change and discussion, though rightfully exercising necessary caution and gradualism and developing fuller understanding of the potential impacts and implications of any changes before their implementation. One example of this goodwill to further discussion and reform is the commitment to consult on enabling councils to levy a tax on development and vacant and derelict land to reduce land banking and increase the supply of homes. Though the current reforms may not go far enough for some, they will undoubtedly leave us in a better place than we were before. And I welcome the variety of contributions we've heard across the chamber today. I'm also a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee and um, can answer Kate Forbes' question that she posed to Andy Whiteman. The information we were given by SPICE said that a revaluation would cost between five and a half and seven million pounds and would take two to three years. There's no such thing as a perfect tax and I don't think anyone's claiming that these reforms solve all the problems, but they're by no means the end of the road. So, to talk, move on and talk about some of the good things that are coming from these reforms, presiding officer. These changes to council tax work to redistribute wealth in our society from those who can most afford it to those who most need it. Those, yes. Mr Kerr. Does Ruth Maguire not agree with me that those in bands E to H are not necessarily the rich, they are not necessarily the wealthy, they are actually middle income families in areas of high value properties such as Aberdeen in the North East? Ms. Maguire. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to not make assumptions about people living in a particular type of property, but the Cabinet Secretary set out in quite, detail, quite detailed form what was, what was being done to assist those families that would struggle to pay. 
Those in the four lowest bands A to D will experience no increase in council tax, meaning that there will be no increase for three out of four households, and that the poorest households in particular, already suffering under Tory austerity, will not be hit by any increase in council tax. The Government's plans to extend the council tax reduction scheme further ensures that nobody is disproportionately affected by these increases. For example, those living in high-banded houses but with an income of less than 25,000 will be exempted from increases through the council tax reduction scheme. The child allowance within the scheme will also be increased by 25%, a further boost to low-income families across Scotland and helping nearly 140,000 children. Figures released by Scotland's statistician in June 2016 showed that the council tax reduction scheme already supports half a million Scottish households and its extension will support tens of thousands more. More importantly still, the 100 million that will be raised from the increase in council tax on the four highest bands will be invested in our schools, supporting our wider progressive aims in government of closing the educational attainment gap between the most and least deprived children in Scotland. And that cash raised for education is going to be spent by head teachers themselves, a concrete, concrete example of this government's commitment to empowering schools and giving head teachers greater autonomy. Local government will also be empowered through this reform. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Excuse me, Presiding Officer. Does the, does the member think it's acceptable to increase the autonomy of head teachers while decreasing the autonomy of our local authorities? I think there's an argument to be made that head teachers and schools know how to best spend money on education and are best placed to help us close the attainment gap. Yeah. Um, we will be making local government more financially accountable to its local communities and give local authorities greater responsibility for their own finances, leading to less dependency on grants from central government. Presiding officer, I'll conclude by saying as we go forward, I would stress again that this is a first step and that I welcome the government's openness um, to, to doing further work. I would urge all parties, local government and wider society to focus on real positive changes within these reforms and work constructively with us over the coming parliamentary term as we implement these first steps towards creating an even fairer and sustainable local taxation system. Thank you very much. Colin Patrick Harvey to wind up for the Green Party. Six minutes, please, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, I'm very glad that we've had this debate. Uh, Derek Mackay also welcomed it and said that the timing was beneficial. Uh, I'm sure he's very grateful for the Greens having pushed for the debate to take place in, in the first place. Uh, we were very clear that this debate, a debate on the Commission report, should happen before the Scottish Government asks Parliament to vote on its modest adjustments to council tax, and I think it's very important that we've had that opportunity. Most members, I think, have placed the issue somewhat into historical context. Um, a lot of people obviously bringing up their, their favourite quotes and speeches from 2007. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll just pick on one uh, totally at random, uh, Bob Doris. Let's go with Bob Doris's speech from 2007. We all enjoy Bob's passionate speech, Bob Doris's passionate speeches. The detestation that society felt for the poll tax in the late 1980s and early 90s still exists for the council tax, he said. And he told us, I believe there's a clear majority in Scotland in favour of scrapping the council tax. We must strive, he said, to find such a majority in this chamber too, a majority that cuts across traditional party lines. I think that is still true, as true as it was when he said it. Uh, I've got another speech here from uh, as far back as uh, just a, a year or so after devolution began from my party's first parliamentary incarnation, Robin Harper, uh, setting out our position on land value tax. And in fact, Andy Whiteman rem reminded me a few minutes ago that even Lloyd George is due some credit uh, on this debate as well. So this goes back a great long time in history. And yet, Mr Mackay tells us, this is not the end of the story, but the beginning. The journey has only just begun. <laughs> I'm not sure I can take that argument seriously. Mr Mackay also complains that the, the concept of progressivity is absent from Murdo Fraser's amendment. More to the point, though, it is absent from government policy. And that's the issue that we're here to debate today. Not only uh, the, 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 the marginal changes that will happen with the multiplier, but the context of rate capping being re reintroduced by policy announcement instead of by statute. The co-opting 
of resources from local taxes for national policies at the very time, at the very time where we now have national tax powers to raise the revenue we need for national priorities. Uh, Murdo Fraser gave us his own, can I say, unique take on the history of local taxation debates. And while he did argue for the simplicity and ease of collection of the current system, he also acknowledged its serious flaws. Critically, uh, his amendment does set out the flaws in Scottish Government proposals for adjustment. And he also clearly cited and contrasted the conclusions of the Commission report uh, with his own party's uh, uh, proposals for adjustment which bear some similarity to current SNP policy. There was a little more history from uh, Jackie Bailey as well, co-opting some of Nicola Sturgeon's speeches to attack today's SNP policy. Tinkering around the edges, she said, is not what the Commission called for. And I think it's worth recalling that when that Commission was first proposed, it was explicitly expected that political parties would offer their proposals for serious change to the people at the election. I, we're now being told that today is just the beginning of the journey. So if real reform is to be achieved during this session, it will be without the opportunity for voters to have their say. My, my colleague Andy Whiteman uh, set out that this parliamentary session does offer an opportunity that shouldn't be missed, and that that was a central conclusion of the, the Commission's report. He also set out some of the treaty obligations around local control of rates and of resources, uh, and the Scottish Government's proposals fly in the face of those obligations. And he, he cited the, um, the injustice experienced by some of his constituents, injustices which will not be addressed, will not be addressed, by Scottish Government proposals. Mr Adam, at the, the back of the chamber, said we should deal with those cases. Well, yes, we should, but we won't be dealing with them by adopting the Scottish Government's current proposals. And Andy Whiteman also cited the roll call of opposition to the Scottish Government's minor marginal adjustments at the edges of council tax, and he challenged Parliament to rise to this opportunity. Well, Greens have done so not only setting out an alternative statutory instrument, which the Scottish Government could adopt, but also publishing our Fair Funding for, Local Service, uh, for Public Services document, which sets out a five-year transition to a better local taxation system with more local control, local economic decision-making for our councils and most households paying less, indeed uh, involving a £10,000 tax-free allowance, as well as a system of reliefs uh, for those who need them. Presiding officer, session after session, this parliament has failed to grasp the issue. The coalition parties didn't agree. The minority government had the, 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 no votes to get their proposals through. The ma majority government didn't have the will to act. This session cannot fail again. As for assigning income tax, Mr Mackay already knows the problems that arise from a complex mechanism between one level of government and another. He's dealing with those problems right now in trying to construct his own budget. Let's not impose something even more chaotic on our local councils. Deputy Presiding Officer, in closing, can I just make one last appeal to the government? At this very moment, with new tax powers coming to the Scottish Parliament, it's time we stopped hoarding what should be local decision-making powers to the national level. Let's empower local government and allow them to make the choices that they should be free to make, and in most European countries, would be. Thank you. I call Alec Rowley. Sweep gear close for Labour Party. Six minutes, Mr Rowley. Thank you very much, President Officer. Ruth Maguire, in summing up for the, the government, said this is the first step. And if that were true, then we may be able to try and build on what the government has brought forward today. But it's not the first step. And even at this stage, I would say to the minister, to the cabinet secretary, look again, work with the other parties in this parliament to look again and bring forward something that will put local government on a sound financial footing. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, would I like now Rowley not reflect on the fact that that is actually what my motion says. I do want to work with uh, parliamentary colleagues to take forward the kind of issues that we've debated today. That is the offer that's made out in the motion in contrast to the Conservatives amendment that says do that but don't worry about the progressive nature yeah. of taxation. Yeah. But we did include that as a foundation of those discussions. Mr Rowley. 
the, the motion, while trying to reach out to other parties, just simply does not go far enough. And if, as I say, this was the first step, then that would be, that would be uh, the way to move forward. But the fact is, as Murdo Fraser, as Jackie Bailey and as others have pointed out in this very good debate that we had today, in 2007, the SNP came into government promising to replace the council tax. A council tax freeze, they said, would be introduced as a short-term measure to medium-term until they were able to bring forward an alternative. At the time, Nicola Sturgeon, and I quote, said, Labour's hated council tax is totally unfair and any tinkering with the bans would not make the system any fairer. Why in 2007 was it so unfair and any tinkering bans would not make it fairer? But today the SNP seem to be suggesting that by tinkering with the bans it's going to be fairer. Ms Forbes. I thank the member for taking an intervention. I wasn't here in 2007, but as I understand it, the government didn't get enough support to scrap the council tax at the time, and Labour was in opposition. Mr Rowley. Well, the government have been in term for two offices now, and two terms of office, and still we have the council tax. At the time in 2007, the SNP were absolutely clear. Nicola Sturgeon said, it's time to scrap the council tax. Some nine or ten years later, we're back here tinkering with the council tax. Over nine years, where many local services are now buckling under the financial pressure, and yet again, what we actually have is the SNP bottling it when it comes to bringing forward a replacement. And now I would suggest what they actually want to do is tinker again. As Bob Doris said in the debate, this, these reforms are not the end, they are the start. But, you know, you've had 10 years, we should be much for, further forward and local government cannot continue to take the level of cuts that they're taking and the impact on communities. They set up a commission, they ignore what it says, they bring forward yet again a stick and plaster solution that will further damage local services while continuing to undermine democracy. The Minister Derek Mackay in his speech said that it is difficult. This morning, I reread the submission to the Commission from Unison Scotland, of which I am a member, and there was a sentence that I thought best describes where we are at. They said in their submission, we must find a solution. The problems are not technical, they are political. It is time for some grown-up decisions to be taken across all political parties. But sadly, in this chamber today, it would seem that when it comes to funding local services, the only party that is not able to face up to making such decisions is the party of government, the SNP. Instead, they propose yet again another fudge that quite simply fails to address the issues at hand. And who will be the losers for that failure? For starters, it will be the people who need to access public services. And as we've seen from the report published this morning by the Council Commission on Social Work in Scotland, social care services cannot cope with the increasing levels of demand and older people who need those services are being denied those services. This is predicted to get much worse unless something is done. On the subject of social work, I would also suggest that we need an urgent review, urgent review of children and family services for the level of underfunding that is putting massive pressure on staff and their ability to meet the growing needs being placed upon them. But it is also local communities up and down Scotland that are seeing the impact of the failure of this SNP government to properly fund local government. Whether that is the local environment, the cuts to local groups who are the backbone of community organisations, the cuts to youth services that are taking place where they're able to deliver less and less services for our young people in the community, the local libraries that are becoming less and less, and even where local services survive, we're seeing increased in charges and associated charges that mean that for many people trying to access local services, there is a barrier to doing so. And I could talk not about just the cuts to local services, 
without mentioning the state of our streets and our roads. The impact is right across. The next time you drive on a pothole, just remember it was the SNP that done it. Because right across, right across Scotland, we have seen a complete lack of investment in public services and roads and infrastructure. Today, there is an opportunity. I hope the Parliament will take that opportunity. Let's once and for all put local government finance on a sound footing. Thank you. I call um, Graham Simpson, to the Conservative Party. Mr Simpson, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this has been uh, an interesting, I think, the important debate uh, to have. There have been some uh, uh, interesting contributions, uh, starting with uh, Derek Mackay, who told us, while uh, keeping a straight face, uh, that the uh, journey has uh, only just begun. Uh, but, of course, as uh, Jackie Bailey and Patrick Harvey uh, pointed out, that's uh, far from being the case. Um, the journey started a long time ago and has been going round in circles ever since. Um, uh, we'll also thank uh, Modo Fraser for giving us uh, a, a unique historical perspective and spelling out some of the issues. Uh, we come to this on the back of a report from a cross-party commission set up by the SNP, but which was largely ignored. The Commission for Local Tax Reform uh, came up with some proposals which are was definitely worthy of consideration. Um, Revaluation, uh, for example, uh, as Bob Doris seems to agree with. Uh, on this side of the chamber, we don't see any merit in scrapping council tax, but reform is needed. We never agreed with Nicola Sturgeon when she described it as hated, and we welcomed the SNP's conversion to our way of thinking largely. Um, however, we are vehemently against the double council tax whammy, which could be unleashed on more than half a million households in Scotland. Part one of the whammy is the automatic rise in tax for ordinary Scots that councils would have no choice over, and I'll be concentrating my remarks on this. Part two, the potential additional 3% rise in some bans has not been announced anywhere other than the SNP manifesto. Let's deal with part one. The Scottish Government's proposal to raise £100 million on the back of councils take us into uncharted waters. They're taking what should be a local tax set locally and spent locally and turning it into a national tax set by the Scottish Government I will in a sec, and spent by them, though collected by someone else. Mr Mackay. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, was Graham Simpson not in the chamber earlier? I think he was, though, uh, when I stated that every penny raised through council tax will stay with those local authorities. The adjustments we make will be around the revenue support grant in a very similar fashion to business rates, which the Conservatives don't seem to object to, nor understand local government funding. Council tax will stay with local councils. How much clearer can I be? Thank Mr you. Simpson. Well, I, I, I thank Mr Mackay for setting me up for, for, for that one, because, as he well knows, there is no mechanism for the Scottish Government to take council tax from councils. But what they'll do is they'll grab it in another way. Yeah. They'll cut the grant. Yeah. So they're getting, the, they're getting the money in another way, Mr Mackay, as you well know. Now, when I challenged John Swinney uh, last week to explain why this is not more centralisation, he was unable or unwilling to answer the point, and that's because this is more centralisation. It is, in our view, a dangerous step towards goodness knows what form of local government reorganisation the Scottish Government has in mind. Their proposals breach a central tenet of our taxation system that, thus far that the taxes you pay are set by the politicians elected to spend them. If it's council tax, then it should be set by councillors, a point apparently lost on George Adam. If national government wants to raise money, they should use the levers available to them, income tax, for example. They should not get others to do their dirty work. The American politician James Otis said in the 1760s, taxation without representation is tyranny. 
And while I don't put what is being proposed quite as strongly as Mr Otis, it's a very serious matter indeed. It's unheard of, in fact. We've had ring fence money in the past, but that stole money passed to local government for them to spend. This is entirely different. You could call it the robbing Peter to pay Paul tax, or for the purposes of next year's council elections, the NAT tax. It really is quite outrageous for the Scottish Government to get someone else to raise money for them. People need to be under no illusions that when they, re when they receive their higher ta council tax bills next year, some or all of that increase, depending on where you live, will be down to Derek Mackay and John Swinney. Two political highwaymen riding off with their swag bags, chortling to themselves that it will be councillors and not them who will get the blame. And that's why the Scottish Government's motion has a brass neck about it for mentioning local accountability. It's precisely the opposite of what the SNP are proposing, and that's why we've tabled the amendment that we have. Let's look at some of the detail. There's a lot missing so far. We know, for instance, that there are disparities across the country before, between what increase people will pay. If you happen to live in a bandy property in Aberdeen, you'll pay an extra £113 a year. If you're in a band H home, then that will be £554. Mr Simpson's in his last minute. I, 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 sad, sadly, or I'd been glad to give way to you, Mr Stewart. Um, on, the, on the other hand, if you're in the Western Isles, those figures will be £94 and 461. There are big questions still to be answered. Mr Swinney has not yet told us how the money is to be divided up, under what criteria and by who, nor do we know what the mechanism will be for taking the money from councils, as that's not spelled out in the legislation. We can guess at it. Legislation, which, as Andy Whiteman has said, may even be illegal under European law. You couldn't make it up. Council tax does need reform. The way to do it, though, is not to turn it into a national tax. Thank you very much. Colin Kevin Stewart to wind up the government. Minister, till four, please. Uh, presiding officer, I think it would be fair to say that we've had uh, an interesting debate uh, this afternoon. Uh, and before I address some of the points made, I'd like to reflect a little on the wider policy context. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have all been able to draw upon the definitive work of the Commission on Local Tax Reform, which was chaired by not only Marco Biaggi, uh, but also David O'Neill, just to set the record straight for Jackie Bailey, uh, presiding officer. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the commissioners who invested considerable time and effort to deliver a report which brings the issues alive, including setting out the impacts of change and how they might be administered. Uh, and the thing about the Commission itself is that it talked not only of property taxes, but also of income taxes and also of land taxes. And as the Cabinet Secretary has said, this is the beginning of a journey. Uh, we have put forward proposals uh, to readjust the council tax. We will consult on vacant and derelict land tax, and we will consult and the assignation of income tax, thus fulfilling all three of the areas covered by the Commission. And I will. Mr Rennie. If the journey is just beginning, when on earth is it coming to an end? <laughs> Mr Stewart. Uh, with uh, cooperation from all parties, we can discuss the way forward and then we can maybe see where we come to an end. However, what, what Mr Rennie suggested today, presiding officer, was a, a new land value, t uh, value uh, tax which wasn't mentioned in his manifesto and no one today has given an indication of how long their proposals will take or in the Conservatives' case, they haven't given us any proposals at all. In developing the reforms now before the Parliament, the Scottish government, government has maintained our adherence to the Adam Smith principles of taxation, which is efficiency, convenience, certainty, and being proportionate to the ability to pay. 
the present, uh, the present council tax, for all of its flaws, does in fact tick some of those boxes. It is efficient to administer. Administration only costs 1.9 per cent of the total taxes collected. Payment is not administratively burdensome, rather it is relatively convenient. Certainty for the taxpayer in these tough times is absolutely crucial. People need to be able to plan and to budget. Is the present council tax proportionate to the ability to pay? On its own, council tax is not. Just Change highlights that our reform target that very issue. But there's a system of reliefs to council tax that takes account of need and income. And I'll give way to Mr Harvey. Mr Harvey. I'm very grateful. The minister tells us that people need to be able to plan for their financial futures. So do our local authorities. How on earth does assigning a proportion of income tax and, I assume by implication, abolishing council tax, leaving them reliant on unpredictable income sources, how on earth does that give them the ability to plan for the future? Uh, we will consult, as we said, with local authorities to allow them uh, to, the, to plan for the future. Now, let me, let me move on to um, what the Resolution Foundation has said about the SNP proposals. They say the SNP's tax increase would raise revenue in a progressive manner, with a Tax rising the tax rise falling harder on higher income households. That is what the Resolution Foundation has said. Many seem to disagree with that today, but that is the reality. More progressive, where it seems, it seems that the Conservatives, in terms of their amendment, want to take progressivity right out of the equation. Um, as, the, as the Cabinet Secretary for Finance uh, and the Constitution described, the council tax reduction schemes means that net council tax liabilities are progressive for the lowest income households. Our reforms to the council tax also reflect a pledge by the First Minister, a commitment repeated in our manifesto. This is for the additional revenues raised to contribute towards raising standards in schools and closing the attainment gap delivering opportunities to our young people, no matter their family background. And if we listen to some of the speeches today, you would think that the government was going to take that £100 million and keep it all for itself. The reality is that this money is going down to local levels to support children and to raise attainment in this country. Surely that's an ambition that all parties in this chamber should welcome. I'll take an intervention from Mr Simpson. Mr Simpson. I'm uh, grateful, Mr Stewart. Um, perhaps you could tell me uh, who will be dividing up the 100 million. Will it be councils or will it be the government? Mr Stewart. Uh, we will discuss these issues with local government. That has been made quite clear right from the very start. And I actually don't see what's funny about that. That is the way that we normally conduct business. We consult with local government and come to agreement. And, and one of the other things which seems to be lacking today is a basic understanding of uh, how local government finance works yeah. when it comes to distribution methodology. <laughs> no, I'm not going to take an interve intervention. What we have is agreements with local government about needs-based distribution, which have been on the go for years. It happened under previous Tory administrations. It happened under previous Labour and Liberal Democrat administrations. I do not know what is much different now. Now let me go on, let me go on about distribution, because this is not about raising funds in one council area to distribute to another, even though the redistribution of public money based on need is that long established fundamental principle of the funding that we provide to local government. This is about raising educational attainment. Any council choosing to increase council tax will keep all additional revenues from that tax rise. So local financial accountability is preserves, preserved. Councils will still retain all council tax raised in their area. No council will be financially worse off, but there will be an additional the £100 million pounds a year available to spend on schools and children and getting to grips with that attainment gap. 
Other parties have proposed changes to taxation in their manifestos of May this year with the receipts to go directly to schools. Our manifesto proposed this additional funding raised by council tax reform to be allocated directly to those schools based on eligibility for free school meals from 20, 2017 to 2018. This is best for our kids. This is not about centralising uh, power. This is about empowering schools to create the best possible opportunities for our young children. And it seems to me that some folk in this chamber uh, don't want that to happen at all. We have heard, we have heard from some uh, today about re-evaluation. Re re-evaluation would cost some seven or eight million pounds, according to the Scottish Assessors Association, and would take two to three years. And beyond that, um, would hit places like Aberdeen and Edinburgh, where house price inflation has been ha ha highest, the hardest. Something must that Mr Kerr uh, seemed to miss to out in his uh, contribution earlier. Presiding officer, this debate has, been, uh, the, has seen the fulfilment of the Sorry, Commission. Minister, we have to conclude. The next debate is already squeezed. OK, um, in which case I would urge everyone to support the Thank government you. motion today. Thank you. <laughs> that concludes the debate on reforming taxation in Scotland. It's time to move on to the next item of business and allow a minute or so for the front benches to swap places. Thank you.